Good morning. June 15th, Wednesday, here in glorious with stick Illinois. Yes, yes. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures. Follow me along in the scriptures that we will look at here briefly this morning. We <laughs> We are going to be going over a video that a beloved brother sent me. Um, <laughs> the video is from this channel, America the Jesuit Review. And the video, as you can see, is called, What's it like to lead the world's largest cult? Uh, excuse me. The world's largest religious order. Jesuits. Now, you're going to see two ditzy, stupid young ladies. Excuse me. They ain't ladies. Young women. Two ditzy, stupid young women interviewing the most deadliest, dangerous of all men on earth today. Who would that be? Arturo Sosa, the black pope, the head of the Jesuit order. Okay. We're going we're gonna to go through this entire video. It's... Uh, 33 minutes and 21 seconds, and we're going to make some stops along the way, and I'm going to make some pretty heated commentary uh, about this video. Um, those of you now, brethren, uh, Church of the Living God, uh, you know our stances on the Jesuit order. They are, they are the army of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is Satan's church. And her many daughters, uh, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, her many daughters are everywhere. Okay? Are everywhere. Those of you who are unaware, those of you who are unaware, those of you who scoff at the idea that, what, you, you're telling me that Rome's in control of everything? Yes. Yes. Yes, Rome is in control of everything. You, you, you hear a lot about the uh, globalist elites, right? Or the Illuminati. Or the Masons. They're all controlled by the Jesuit order. The Jesuit order, who are infiltrators. Okay? They have infiltrated every single denomination of so-called Christendom. Okay? And they rule all. As a sign, as a thing of judgment upon this earth. Because remember... Satan, when he was tempting Jesus, he said unto him, All this is mine, and it has been given to me, and whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou, for, if thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, uh, never rebuked him for that. Why? Because this world has been given unto Satan, the little G God of this world, for judgment upon this world. And he will do as he sees fit. And Satan's church is the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? You have to understand that. They're, they're, on this channel, on this channel, there's a playlist called Catholicism, Jesuitism. A lot of information for you there if you have any questions about this. And there are those of you out there who scoff at this? Who's like at that, that conspiracy theory? No, it's conspiracy fact. You need to wake up to the reality of the Jesuit order. You need to wake up to the reality of who is actually running the show. Okay? It's not the globalist elites. It's not the Freemasons. It's not the Illuminati. Weissop! Weissop! The founder of the Illuminati! Was a Jesuit, okay? The Freemasons, well provable at one time in history. The Jesuits and Freemasons fought each other. But as the testimony of Brother Alberto Rivera proves, that the head of the Jesuit order in his time was also a Freemason. It's not backwards that the Freemasons have infiltrated the Jesuits. No, the Jesuits have infiltrated the Freemasons and they control everything. Okay? The Jesuits control everything. And you're going to see in this video, Arturo Sosa makes a really good definition of what the Jesuit is. The Jesuit is the neck. The neck that...
puts the head upon the body. You're going to see. You're going to see this. But let's get to some scripture to start, okay? <laughs> Brother who sent me this, well, you sure know how to start off a guy's day, huh? <laughs> sure do. But let's read some scripture from Isaiah chapter 32. Hey, whenever you see scripture or we are reading scripture, always follow me along. Always follow me along, word for word, verse by verse. Make sure I'm reading it right. Make sure I'm not skipping a groove. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. Okay? Got it? Okay. But Isaiah chapter 32, verses 5 on to verse 12. The vile person shall be no more called liberal. Oh, and the Jesuits are liberal with their evil. They sure are. Nor the churl said to be bountiful. For the vile person will speak villainy, and his heart will work iniquity to practice hypocrisy, and to utter error against the Lord, to make empty the soul of the hungry, and he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fall, to fail. Excuse me. The instruments also of the churl are evil. He deviseth wicked devices to destroy the poor with lying words, sophistry. Even when the needy speaketh right, sophistry. What is sophistry? As defined by Webster's 1828 dictionary, just basically, fallacious reasoning, reasoning sound in appearance only. Sound in appearance only. Reasoning that, okay, makes sense, but then, then again, what is it? They're lying words, yea, hath God said. Okay, that's what sophistry is. And Jesuits are masters of sophistry. Jesuits are also master of the euphemism. What is a euphemism? Uh, harsh words softened. Harsher words replaced with better sounding words. As I have given the example before, and uh, I got this actually from George Carlin, who's frying in hell right now, but it is very true. The word shell shock. Shell shock. Okay, was a condition in battle which described, and this George Carlin said this, but it, it's, tr it's true. Shell shock was a uh, condition for those soldiers, I think in World War II or World War I, I think it was World War II, where the, the psychological nervous system of a fighting man has reached the point where it's about to snap or has snapped already. Can't take any more information, any more input. They used to call it shell shock. Shell shock. Shell shock. Sounds like a gun, right? But in time, they changed the name of the condition. They changed it to what? Battle fatigue. And then um, something else. And then something else. Today, that very same condition that was once called shell shock from World War II is now referred to as post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, when it was originally referred to as shell shock. That is a perfect example of euphemistic language. Words, uh, harsh, harsh words softened, or harsh phrases or things substituted for smooth things. The Jesuits are masters of that. And you have seen that in your time today. What they once used to call um, uh, the coronavirus is now simply COVID-19. What was once called the flu is now called COVID-19. Hmm? You see? Partly cloudy became partly sunny. Okay? You see? And that's all Jesuit. The Jesuits rule the media. The Jesuits control the nations. Okay? The Jews do not. It's the Jesuits. Okay? You have to understand that. You have to understand that. But let's continue here. Verse 8 in Isaiah 32. 
But the liberal deviseth liberal things, and by liberal things shall he stand. Rise up, ye women that are at ease. Women. And is not Roman Catholicism, Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth? Amen, she is. Yes. Hear my voice, ye careless daughters, daughters of the whore, daughters of the Vatican. Give ear unto my speech. Many days and years shall ye be troubled, ye careless ones. For the vintage shall fail. The gathering shall not come. Tremble, ye women that are at ease. Be troubled, ye careless ones. Strip you and make you bare, and gird sackcloth upon your loins. They shall lament for the teats, for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine. And, you know, the thing about, too, the Jesuits, and these people in authority, these people high up in powerful places, you know, that are set on pedestals, okay? you got to remember this about these people. In Psalm 73, Psalm 73, verses 1 on to, oh, verse 9. you got to remember this about those who are in the upper echelons, those who have 100,000 su subscribers and getting paid by Jesuit-run Google, okay? You got to remember those people who have devoted disciples who will do their bidding just as an act cadaver. Okay? You have to remember this about the elitists. Okay? Psalm 73, verses 1 on to verse 9. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped. Why? For I was envious at the foolish. Foolish. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So to be foolish is to behave, think, act in a way as if you're saying in, their heart, in your heart, there is no God. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, and oh, the Jesuit order, and those who work for them, like these two little twits, okay? Oh, they're prosperous right now. Now, yes, true, God today, today, with all that's going on, can make uh, one of his body prosper. Yes, he can. But these people are doing it by lying words, by deceit, by murder, by chaos. Not according to the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. Seems that way, doesn't it? Yeah. They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued as other men. You know, I've always had a problem with someone who's sitting high on the hog, talking about how, you know, how to be happy and how to have peace when they have all this world's goods. I've always had a problem with that. And those people who have all this world's good, as we look and as we read in Scripture, um, it says not many mighty, not many noble are called. Why? Because they can trip over their possessions, over, you know, all the lands that they possess, and the 40,000 reasons they have to smile. And they're going to tell you, who can't even pay your bills, who doesn't even have a pot to pee in, basically, to how to be happy. Some of them will even use scripture. Hypocritical scum. Okay? Hypocritical scum. Yeah. They are not in trouble as other men. But see, the love of money is the root of all the evil. For which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Those who have abundance of riches, their problems are not like us who can barely pay our bills. No, their problems is on their possessions, what they see with their eyes. The abundance of the rich will not suffer them to sleep. Okay? Rich people, people who are prosperous in this world, I pity them. I pity them. And so should you. Because in the day of judgment, all their riches, all your lands that you're building your private little compound on, 
and the day of judgment they're going to offer they're going to mean nothing to you and because these people they are not in trouble as other men neither are they plagued like other men you know us common folk therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain violence covereth them as a garment yeah their eyes stand out with fatness they have more than heart can wish <laughs> the Jesuits can buy countries and the souls of men. Yeah. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They speak wickedly according... They speak... Uh, they are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. The lockdowns were a good thing, remember. The CDC, Catholic Disease Creators. And you look at who the head of the CDC is? A Jesuit! Okay? Um, yeah, the lockdowns were a good thing. What's that? And speak wickedly concerning oppression. People losing their jobs over the pandemic. People losing their jobs because they refused to take the steel of the Jesuit poniard. What is that? They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They have set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. What is it like to lead the world's largest religious order? The Jesuits. Well, how about we find out? Now, I'm going to stop periodically through this and I, I gotta warn you you're gonna see me get angry you're gonna see me get angry you're gonna see me spitting into the can right here you're gonna see you're gonna hear me refer to Arturo Sosa the most dangerous deadliest man on this earth as a scumbag okay you're gonna hear me use harsh words if that offends you The, the Jesuits are our enemies. We are to hate them with perfect hatred. If one gets out of them and repents and actually gets saved and, saved and uh, turns to Christ, as Brother Alberto Rivera did, I truly believe he is a saved man in heaven. In heaven, okay? That's a different story. But until that happens, these people are our enemies. Hey, don't forget who your true enemy is. Don't forget who your true enemy is. Because I have many enemies. But they serve these guys. They serve these guys. They might not be them themselves. But they serve them. They serve Satan. Let us never forget who our true enemy is. Okay? Okay? So, let's begin with this, this young twit. <sighs> let's begin. Hi, I'm Ashley McKinless, an executive editor at America Media and a host of the Jesuitical Podcast. You're about to watch a conversation with Father Arturo Sosa, the Superior General of the Society of Jesus. For more videos like this, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And to learn more about the Ignatian Year, visit americamagazine.org. Fancy music, huh? Yeah, remember, Catholics love contemporary Christian music. Yeah. Joining us from Rome is Father Arturo Sosa, the superior... That guy right there, he is the head of the Jesuit order. And we're going to go through some things here, and you're, and you're going to learn a little stuff. Like I said, you check out the playlist about Catholicism, okay? This man right here is the head of all of Catholicism. We're going to talk about Pope... 
We're going to talk about Pope Francis, okay? But this guy right here, he's the head. He is the most powerful man on earth. It's not Putin in Russia. It's not the United Nations, okay? It's definitely not Kamala Harris or that bumbling idiot, Smoking Joe, who's portraying the idiot, by the way. Who's portraying the idiot, by the way. Smoking Joe, he's not, he's not an idiot. He's acting that way because it's an act, okay? To bring about eventually what will be the very first black female president in America, Kamala Harris, okay? Don't, don't, don't think that, don't think that the Jesuits have forgone that, okay? Don't think that. This is the most dang, this is the most dangerous, most powerful man on earth. He answers to only one person, only to one being, Satan himself, okay? Got to know who your enemies are. And all our enemies, brethren, they trace back to this guy, to Satan. Is this guy Satan himself? No. No. He is not that man of sin, the son of perdition. But rather, he is his agent. And the kingdom that the Catholics, the Jesuits are building right now, is that kingdom that that man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to one day just step into. Hate this man. This man is beyond salvation. This man cannot be saved. He is our enemy. He is the enemy of Christ Jesus. Hate this man with perfect hatred. Because he could kill us just like that if he wanted to. Don't forget who your true enemies are, people. It's these guys, the Jesuits. Let's continue. Superior General of the Society of Jesus. Welcome to the podcast, Father Sosa. You're stupid. Hello, how are you? Very well. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, I know you have a busy week, and in fact, we're meeting with Pope Francis uh, just a couple days ago. Is that right? That's right. <laughs> you are very well informed. <laughs> uh, your, the picture was on Twitter, and it looked like you were having fun. <laughs> But so we, we do have to ask, um, since you are the Superior General of the of the Jesuits and Pope Francis is our first Jesuit Pope, who's who's in charge between the two of you? Do you do you report to him or does he report to you? Now, we're going to get to a piece of an article from their very own confession. But watch how Sosa answers this. Watch how he answers this. He uses sophistry beautifully, beautifully. He answers the question, yet he doesn't really answer it. This is textbook, classic, Jesuitical sophistry. Watch this. Watch this. She did this stupid little girl. She asked him, well, who's in charge? <laughs> Watch this. Okay? Watch this. He is the Pope. <laughs> oh, so it's very clear. But he's still a <laughs> Jesuit. <laughs> Every Jesuit reports to the court, to the Pope, mm -hmm. and it is maybe to 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 explain that when a Jesuit becomes a bishop, he the obedience is not more is not anymore for the superiors of the society. No, mm -hmm. the bishop depends on the Pope. And the Pope depends on himself, <laughs> on the spirit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, because as you maybe remember, Ignatio de Loyola used to call the Pope the Vicar of Christ in Earth. The Vicar of Christ. Another Christ! That's what Vicar of Christ is. Another Christ. Yeah. Yeah, here's, here's what I think of the Vicar of Christ. <laughs> yeah. So he's the Pope. So <laughs> the Pope. I, I come to him. <laughs> <laughs> he's the Pope. He's the Pope. Yeah, he's the Pope. He didn't answer the question, did he? No, he didn't. He answered the question without answering the question. Oh, that is so Jesuit. What do they say themselves, okay? 
going to be reading something to you from the Black Oath, the Secret Oath of the Jesuits, which if you go to the About section, this is under the link called Bible Believers, okay? The title, the name of it is whatever, but it's, it's this very thing right here. Okay, which is the black oath, is the uh, secret oath of the Jesuits. Okay, where I'm going to read to you something. Okay, and this is how it is for every Jesuit. The Jesuit is a lifeless body within the hand of the superior general. Okay, every Jesuit is subservient unto the head of the Jesuits. And Arturo Sosa is the head of the Jesuits. Pope Francis, a Jesuit, you saw this little twit say it herself. Well, wait, does he answer to you with it? And he and Pope's like, well, and Pope uh, Sosa, he is the black Pope, and he's obviously not black. Okay, he's obviously of Japheth. Okay, yes, he is. Black Pope meaning that he's he's in the shadows. He's in blackness. He, he rules the things by, like a marionette in the background. He is the head of the Jesuit order. He is the head of Catholicism. Sosa um, goes to him, okay? But you see, he answered the question, but he didn't answer the question. Who's in charge? What do they say in their own writings about what a Jesuit is to do? Remember, the Jesuit has no will. The Jesuit has no will. The only will they have is the will that their superiors give them. They don't have a mind of their own, even though they are very brilliant and intelligent. Yes, they are. They can't think for themselves. They are machines. They are robots. They are programmed what to think. Okay? But here's what they say themselves. From the uh, secret oath of the Jesuits. Okay? I further, I further promise and declare that I will have no opinion or will of my own or any mental reservation whatsoever, even as a corpse or cadaver, perendi a cadaver, but will unhesitatingly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superiors in the militia of the Pope and of Jesus Christ. Every Jesuit of the vow of the fourth vow, this is the this is sometimes referred to as the blood oath, okay? But all Jesuits are taught obedience. Obedience. There is not like uh, Eric John Phelps said, there is no such thing as a disobedient Jesuit. They are under orders. Okay? That's why a captain, Captain J.W. Smith, I believe his name was, who sunk the Titanic, that's why a captain can go down on the ship of a Titanic because he was a Jesuit coadjutor working for the Jesuits. He didn't wear the little dog collar like you see Sosa there with that... Uh, Okay? These people have no will of their own. They are mindless robots fed what to think and what to believe. Okay? And also, too, also, too, not done with this, but also, too, also, too, I want to read you this. This little snippet here. This little snippet here. Uh, where was that? Got to find it. Bear with me. Bear with me. This is not necessarily um, impromptu. But, here is a quote from Richard W. Thompson about the Jesuits, okay? And this, what I'm reading to you from, is in a video, this is a transcript of the video Jesuit Secrets Revealed, okay? Which is on this channel, you can find it. May leave it, I'll, I'm going to be leaving a lot of stuff in the description box, just so you know. But, here's what Richard W. Thompson said about the Jesuits, Okay? The Jesuits are the deadly enemies of civil, of civil and religious liberty. The Jesuit general occupies the place of God. And towards the end of this video, you're going to see this, that little Ashley McNeil, whatever her name is, that little idiot. 
and I'm being polite, okay? An idiot is someone void of logic and reason. These, these two little girls, they're idiots. They're idiots, okay? But this, that girl right there towards the end of this is going to say, uh, we need to pray to Arturo Sosa. You'll see. The Jesuits are the deadly enemies of civil and religious liberty. The Jesuit general occupies the place of God and must be obeyed. Howsoever the peace and welfare of the multitude may be imperiled, or the nations be convulsed from center to circumference, the society of Jesuits must obtain the mastery, even if general anarchy shall prevail of all the world besides be can or all the worlds besides be can covered with the fragments of a universal wreck the sovereigns of the holy alliance had massed large armies and soon entered into a pledge to devote them to the suppression of all uprisings of the people in favor of free government and he, Pius the, what is it, 5, 6, 7th, desired to devote the Jesuits, supported by his pontifical power, to the accomplishment of that end. He knew how faithfully they would apply themselves to that work, and hence he, cons he counseled them in his decree of restoration to strictly observe the useful advices and salutary counsels whereby Loyola had made absolution the cornerstone of the society. So, you see, the Jesuits are trained, taught, to see this guy as God. He answered the question without answering the question. People, Pope Francis answers to Arturo Sosa. Arturo Sosa is the head of the Jesuit, Jesuit order. Okay? Sosa answers to him. Do you understand? Okay? This guy is the head of everything. This guy is the most powerful man on earth. He is Roman Catholicism today. Paving the way for that man of sin, the son of perdition, to come into the kingdom that he and his army is building. Okay? Now let's continue this. <laughs> <laughs> what is it like to, to sit down and, and chat with them? Do you guys have a good relationship? No, it's a, it's a, very, it's a very fraternal and respectful relationship. I'm sorry to subject you to this, but we must, for sake of doing this, go through this entire thing. I do apologize. Uh, Pope Francis knows very well the society of Jesus. And of course. He knows yeah, of course how Jesus can yeah. help yeah. him. And, uh, and he knows what to ask to the society and which persons can be missioned for his projects. So he asks also very specific help and very specific persons to do it and uh, in a in a very fraternal uh, way we know each other's many 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 years ago but he's older than me so it's a it's a a, a relationship that has been growing uh, differently in different moments of my life mm -hmm. So you've said the Pope is the Pope. He's the Vicar of Christ on Earth. Uh, who is the Superior General? What is what is your job, um, and and um, how would you describe it? Now we already read a quote of what the job of the Jesuit General is. He is the forerunner of that man of sin, the son of perdition. He is the one all the little people answer to their provincial. The provincial answers to their provincial, and it all funnels down onto this guy. This guy is ruling the world from the Vatican right now. Okay, he is not. This he is not the man of sin, the son of perdition. Why? Why? How can you be so sure? Because when you read Second Thess uh, Thessalonians chapter two, that man of sin, the son of perdition, will not be revealed until we, the Church of the Living God, be redeemed. Okay. 
So uh, this guy is not that man of sin, the son of perdition. Neither is it is that macaroni guy from France. I don't know what Mr. Grider is smoking. It's definitely not something to his benefit. Okay? But this guy is not that man of sin, the son of perdition. But uh, this guy controls the world. At his dictate, nations rise, nations fall. Okay? They are to see this man as a god. Keep that in mind. Well, I describe it as, as the neck, as the neck of a body. No? As the neck of a body that supplies the, uh, the that connects the body, the physical body, and the head. Very good way to describe it. Because within the neck, you have the brain stem that feeds the brain. In the neck, you have the beginning of the spinal column that can, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Uh, you know that uh, Ignatius and uh, St. Paul uh, love to use the image of the body for the church and for the society of Jesus. And we already read about how they are an act cadaver, a dead corpse in the hand of the Jesuit general. A sword has no mind of its own, but it does whatever the hand uses it to do. Okay? That's what the Jesuit is to be. Okay? And I, I feel I am the neck of a body uh, that when the head is Jesus Christ. That is the, the head. And the superior... No, the head of uh, their body is Satan. The general is the one who, who tries to assure the connection between the body and its head, that is Christ, and that's my that's my task to be the neck, to be the perfect description of the pyramid between structure. the society of Jesus and the head Jesus Christ. What are your favorite and least favorite parts of this job? And be part of a universal, intercultural body that is uh, so alive. So the contact with the different members of the body is is a, is a, my favorite uh, part of the of my task. No, visits in place are a privileged moment, but also the communication through other means, meetings in rooms, letters, emails, Zoom meetings that have multiplied in this uh, pandemic uh, year. But uh, because that, as I said before. IHS, IHS, uh, you, when it comes to Catholicism, you see a lot of IHS. They tell you that IHS stands for Jesus Hamador Salvatore, Jesus, the Savior of Man. That's what they say IHS stands for. Actually, what it stands for in reality is Isis Horus Set the satanic Egyptian trinity, okay? That's what it stands for. You see IHS, it's the symbol of Satan, okay? Kind of like the sex symbol of the, the Masons, which is on the dollar bill here in America, okay? The dollar bill, you know, the, the um, image of Ra that is on the dollar bill, the eagle, that's the uh, image of Ra, and you see the pyramid with the all-seeing eye of Horus on it. And right above the eagle, look at your dollar bill. He, you here in America. Okay, on the back side where it says that. Okay, that's the that's the eagle of Ra. That's Ra the sun god on the dollar bill. And right above that, you can make it out in the triangle. It's the sign of the Masons. Okay, which is a sex symbol. The square and the compass. Okay. The one on top is the male, the one on the bottom is the female. You put them together, the star of, you know, the seal of Solomon, which is not the true um, flag of Israel, okay? IHS. ISIS or set. Just so you know, okay? Being an egg, I always in contact with the, the, the whole part of the, of, of the body. And uh, I think it's uh, really uh, amazing how you every day have a surprise. Sometimes mm -hmm. very positive, sometimes not so positive, sometimes very negative. 
but all you you have no time to be uh, you always can have a surprise every every mm -hmm. paper that comes to my to my desk I say let's see what happens here <laughs> what are the uh, what are the more challenging parts of your job that people might not know about there's a quote from that movie The Princess Bride where he says <laughs> Try whirling the world sometime. It's not easy to find what is the least favorite. You know, maybe maybe uh, feeling lack of time and energy. To that makes sense. All the challenge that the body of the society has today, looking forward to contribute in a, shaping a new world based in reconciliation and justice. No, I I feel that uh, I need more more time and more energy and more creativity uh, in my in my own in my own uh, job yeah. that makes a lot of sense so the podcast that I host is called Jesuitical and we always say we're not Jesuits but we work with them so as we're not Jesuits but we work for them uh, then according to them they, they themselves you're a Jesuit little girl Ashley You're stupid. You're stupid and you're ignorant. And God help you. You foolish little girl. Colleen and I are lay people who work for a Jesuit apostolate. Um, are you technically our boss? Are we like the pinky toe of, of this body that you're in charge of? <laughs> Yes, yes, you little girl, yes. He is your boss, yes, he is. Oh, I am not, I am not. <laughs> Just lie. can be one who inspires your work. Okay. You might be saying, well, Brad, that's just for the fourth vow. Uh, obedience is drilled into the head of every Jesuit. Okay. Yes, I do further promise and declare that I will have no opinion of my own. Oh, no opinion or will of my own or any mental reservation whatsoever, even as a corpse or cadaver, perindi a cadaver, but will unhesitatingly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superiors in the militia of the Pope and of Jesus Christ. So she then, look at that. <laughs> uh, yes, he is your boss. He is your boss. He is your boss. And I can bet you them two little girls probably took the steel of the Jesuit Panier too. <laughs> Helps to find the sense of what you are doing and living when you share the same mission. Well, you mentioned that uh, you will hope to inspire us in our mission. So let's talk a little bit about that mission. Uh, right now we are in the Ignatian year, which is a celebration of the 500th anniversary of the cannonball injury that St. Ignatius experienced while he was defending Pamplona. And, you know, we all know this story. It was a pivotal moment in his life. He was on bed rest. He began his conversion process then. Why is it important for the Jesuits to return to that moment of conversion in Ignatius's life? What does it teach us today? Well, we do not return to, we are not going back. We are not going back. Remember at the start of the pandemic that these people, the Jesuit order instituted the pandemic uh, operation, uh, the Poison Crown, which was a psychological operation where they used a biological weapon to get people sick and kill many people. Okay, that was his thing. We can't go back. We can't go back. Okay. Their whole goal is to con convert people onto Catholicism, to bring all the erring people back under the headship of Rome, similar to as it was during the Dark Ages. It was called the Dark Ages because that was a time of darkness where the scriptures were not allowed onto the general populace. Okay? That's why it was called the Dark Ages, when Rome ruled. Okay? But, yeah, very interesting. We, we can't go back. We can't go back. That's what he said about the pandemic. Okay? Preparing the way for that man of sin, the son of perdition. That's what he's talking about. Okay. Make memory of mm -hmm. a special moment that actually opens a new path 
for the life of a man, Ignatius of Loyola. And the pandemic, the psychological operation, did open a new path for these people to control, to destroy. Okay, the thief cometh not but to destroy and to kill. It's a thieves. Okay, a moment that led him to found the Society of Jesus. A body is still alive that can learn a lot of uh, his process. That's why we are uh, remembering that because we can still learn a lot from Ignatius' process. A very important teaching is that finding Jesus in our life, we can experience styles of living we cannot even imagine by ourselves. And that's what happened to Ignatius. Ignatius, Ignatius uh, de Loyola, the head and founder of the Jesuit order, who could uh, apparently levitate, who was so demon, uh, demon, excuse me, who was so devil infested, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ignatius of Loyola, not someone that you want to have as a, on your high list of good people. Just never imagine what his life became. Note the nimbus, the nimbus around the head, uh, onto the Catholic, the nimbus that means deity, godhood. After the personal encounter with Christ. If we open ourselves to deep our relationship with Jesus and things will become new to our eyes and new dimensions of our life mission will be renewed in a way we cannot plan or even imagine. That's why we, in this year, we don't talk about Ignatius. We talk about how we can see all things new, thing from the point of view of Christ. That's what Ignatius learned in his own. And you got to remember, when he says Christ, when he talks about Jesus Christ, he's not talking about the Christ Jesus of the scriptures. He is talking about that man of sin, the son of perdition, who will be in, uh, dwelt by uh, Satan himself. The Christ that he is mentioning is in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 on to verse 15. Brethren, you are aware of this. Uh, many are not, so bear with me. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 on to verse 15. Okay? This is the Christ whom Arturo Sosa is talking about. Isaiah 14, verses 12 on to verse 15. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Satan wants to be God. And the Christ that he is talking about is not the God of the scriptures, but is Lucifer, Satan. And let's remember, always remember about Satan. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. If you're a Catholic, you're going to lose. If you're Catholic, there's no hope for you. You are in Satan's church. You are in Satan's religion. You need to repent and get out of that before it is too late. Hey, Catholic. Tell me. Do you know you're going to heaven or not? Do you know for sure that when you die, you're going to go to heaven? There, Mr. or Mrs. Christian, huh? You can't answer that, Catholic. You can't. Because you don't know. If you die in a state of grace, but still you don't know. You don't know. Because that's the sin of presumption, right? Right. We know. We who are truly saved, born again, converted of the church of God. We know that we are saved. We know we are going to heaven. 
Why? Because it's written in the record that God gave of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Come, let us reason together, you and I, okay? In the description box, let's continue. Process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I certainly never imagined I would host a podcast, much less talk to the head of the Jesuits. So <laughs> his, Ignatius was right about, about that. Um, and so you say we need to learn to see again, and um, the Jesuits have uh, put out priorities for the next 10 years about how, how they're going to approach their ministry. And they, they focus on the spiritual exercises and discernment, Spiritual exercises, the foundation of modern mind control, okay? Breaking the man's mind, fragmenting it, and then reprogramming it, teaching um, how to smell the smokes of, of the fires and how to meditate and stuff like that. It's mind control. The spiritual exercises are mind control, okay? The foundation for modern mind control, okay? That's what they are walking with the marginalized, accompanying young people, and caring for creation. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, as I said before, we're not Jesuits, but we work with them. So what do these priorities Jesuit, mean yeah. for people like us, lay people Point who are involved in a Jesuit ministry or maybe work with students at a Jesuit school? Um, what, do you, what do you hope these priorities inspire in our work? Well, we don't talk is, is, uh, strictly about priorities. Uh, we talk about preferences and preferences that uh, because we are not preferences. Preferences. Did you catch that? We don't talk about priorities. Black and white. We talk about we talk about preferences. Gray area. Did you catch that? We don't talk about priorities. It is a priority for you, dear friend, that you get an authorized version of the scriptures, King James Version, and read this. This is the scriptures. This is the word of God, okay? It is your priority to come to the Lord on his terms, broken, contrite, and in fear of him, call upon his name that he may save you. But see, they're about preferences. Gray area. Oh, 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 the, the King James, that's too archaic for me. So I'll go to the non-King James Version. Ah, that, that's still a little too legalistic. I'll, I'll go to the NIV. Oh, oh, I, I the Methodists, they're, they're too silly. I'm going to go to Lutherans who are Catholic. Ah, none of that. I want to go to the old time religion there. Yeah, yeah, buddy. So I'm going to go Baptist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and maybe even the Southern Baptists, who, just like the Catholics have, their big problems with sex and rape and sodomy and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, and I never got that link for that, um, that uh, article that a Catholic wrote about the Southern Baptists, how he was saying, they have the same problems as we do. So, see, we're all, and see, that's the thing, preferences over priorities. Preferences over priorities. Relativism over absolutes. This is absolute truth. Jesus Christ, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's what he said. That was an absolute statement, excluding all other things except he himself. That was a statement of absolutism. But no, we're not about priorities, but about preferences. Ooh. You know, kind of a hierarchy between different kinds of apostolates, no? We are, mm -hmm. we are trying to have a, a kind of uh, orientations for all what we do in all, all our other apostolates that are so different in the society and continuing with the image of the of the body i used to uh, compare the apostolic preferences with a hand 
a hand that is connected with with the body through look at that hand signal he's giving there by the way but the hand and remember the Jesuit is taught that they are a sword in the hand of their superior general a sword that has no mind of its own no will of its own but when it's in the hand of the Jesuit it has a use see see he's right now portraying the Jesuit doctrines of what we already looked at in their secret oath okay the wrist and the wrist is moved by the head no the holy spirit jesus and the hand needs five fingers and to work to work well you need the five fingers so we have four apostolic preferences no you just mentioned it and we have an uh, another one no? that is the thumb is the collaboration because we are not alone. The Society of Jesus is not only the only uh, group that is working in many other things. So, and that's true because they have infiltrated all the denominations. They they own the media. They own here at least in America. They own the medical establishment. Okay, uh, they're. Uh, the religions here in America, they have infiltrated. They own all the schools. They run all the schools. It's like, Brad, the public schools, the public schools, what, the schools of law? Yes. Yes. There are schools that are openly Jesuit. Yes, there are. But if you think for a moment that the Jesuits haven't infiltrated the public schools, you, you, you're a little slow in the head there, son. Okay? especially here in America America is a Jesuit nation so what he is saying is absolutely true yes yeah the Jesuits are the ones that manipulate everything okay they are the controlling factor all right and all their sub order orders and all their you know like the Knights of Malta and the Knights of Columbus and stuff like that the Knights the banks and stuff like that the Jesuits control the banking system especially here in America the Federal Reserve okay okay he, he's he's telling you bold-facedly what the Jesuits are, are about see he's doing what is called the esoteric exoteric thing esoteric is a form of speech designated to only be understood by the elite yeah. and exoteric is a form of speech or doctrine that is made to uh, be understood by the general populace that doesn't have that in crowd knowledge okay he's demonstrating it okay wow so we need to collaborate and we need these four uh, special preferences in every action every community every apostolic work everything and and he keeps using apostolic catholics are big on apostolic apostolic returning to the time the times of the apostles um beware of people who throw around the word apostolic quite often as the catholics there was a guy his name was arthur katz art katz he was a jewish guy who was all about apostolic this, apostolics that, uh, uh, received his degree at Berkeley and also was uh, part Lutheran or something like that, but yet he was a Jew. Yeah, he was all about apostolic this, apostolic that. Yeah, yeah. Watch out for that. We do, and that's why we can move like a good hand that can have uh, uh, all the complexity of movements of a hand. Mm -hmm. Now, one of those important areas of collaboration that I know the Jesuits uh, are looking at right now is uh, is collaboration with women, right? In in various areas of your work, and on International Women's Day last in, in March, uh, you announced the creation of this new commission on the role and responsibilities of women in the Society of Jesus. Uh, oh, about how the Society of Jesus uses women. 
you read uh, the testimony of Brother Alberto Rivera, how the Jesuit order would use you women as plants, as decoys, as uh, spies, as informants. Um, there you read in the testimony of Brother Alberto Rivera about how the Jesuit girls would go in using sexuality to trip up pastors and stuff like that. Kamala Harris is a Jesuit. Okay? Proven. Kamala Harris is a Jesuit. They even put the uh, nimbus on the head of Kamala Harris uh, signifying that she's deity. Don't, brethren, people, don't, don't forget. The Jesuits have big plans for Kamala Harris. Okay? So, y yes, yes, yes. But see, what the Jesuits are doing are perverting the role of the woman in the sight of God's plan and using you women as weapons. Because the end justifies the means. Okay? Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Okay? 1 Timothy chapter 5. This is this is basically what the Jesuit is doing with uh, unto women. Okay? First uh, First Timothy chapter 5. We want verses 13 on to verse 15. First Timothy, get my if I could get there. Verses 13 on to verse 15. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. And you got to remember too, ultimately, ultimately, what God created you woman for. Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 on to verse 25. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And the Bibles messed this up, of course. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. What does woman mean? Because she was taken out of man. That's what woman means, of man. Woman, of man. Okay? Okay. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, and all the while, yeah, the Jesuits are all about using women to their advantage, and all the while damning them to hell. So what does the society hope to accomplish in terms of looking for new forms of collaboration with women? Oh, we collaborate with women uh, sharing the mission in many, many ways. And, and my hope is to deepen Formance, in all kinds murders, of collaboration yeah. with women. I don't have the numbers in my, in my hands, but I think uh, uh, the majority of, uh, of uh, people who is sharing the mission with the Jesuits in this moment are women. If we took mm -hmm. uh, uh, any any of uh, and look at that little one, Colleen. There, uh -huh, uh -huh, yeah, it's called Jezebel. Jezebel. You read in the scriptures of Jezebel, perfect example of the spirit of Antichrist of Catholicism. And quite, quite frankly, um, a actual Catholic woman, Jezebel. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know if any of you have had any uh, conversations with a Catholic woman before who apparently knows their stuff a little bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the biggest, the biggest uh, known uh, area of apostolate that is education, there are uh, thousands, maybe millions of women uh, working uh, together uh, in all the institutions that the Jesuits can uh, run in this moment. So, even in the universities, even in the parishes, uh, in social centers, the presence of women in our apostolic life is really a, a huge presence, a very important presence. And as Jesuits, we need to listen better to the voice of women with whom we work together. We need to be conscious of the process we are already living and take advantage in the best possible way. So that's the, the idea of the commission that has been created uh, some weeks ago, has been appointed to help me. And see all that blah, 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 that he just said. He, what they're doing is taking you women and turning you against the Lord and against the scriptures to do things that you ought not to do as women. And remember, um, they use, the Jesuits use women as plants, as informants, even as assassins. You read in the Apocrypha about Judith, okay? <laughs> and remember, the Apocrypha is not inspired scripture. Okay, and isn't it interesting it is found within the Apocrypha, the majority of Catholic doctrine? Yeah, yeah. Why was the Apocrypha taken out of the scriptures? Uh, it, was never the, it was never scripture to begin with. Yes, in the 1611, and yes, in this, even this one that I use has the Apocrypha. Yes, it does. But uh, like King James said, I omit them, for I am no papist. Like I said, you read the Apocrypha, that's where you find the majority of Catholic doctrine. Okay? Just, just to let you know. Let's continue. And the whole body of the society in this process of better hearing the voices of the women um, to deepen the collaboration among us. Yeah. Had it. What would, what would you like to say to, to those women that you're... Um, seeking deeper collaboration with. We, we have, you know, some, some women who listen to these podcasts who work in Jesuit apostolates. Um, is there a special message that you would like um, for them to hear, especially in this Ignatian year? And majority of the glory, huh? Well, I, I hope, I hope they, they are uh, able to help us, me and all the, the to, to, to be sensible to those dimensions of life that maybe we are not always in the first place putting in in, in our face and i think the 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 women's sensibility sensitivity sensibility is very important to and keep in mind and the link will for this will be in the sacrita monita when you hear about what they would what the jesuits would do to widowed women how they would use them to get money out of them and just basically use them as a piece of meat. Yeah. Yeah. To understand better the world uh, we are uh, working on and also the better way... The world we are working we are, on. We have one synthesized our, yeah. our mission in the world reconciliation. And this is one of the big, uh, the biggest uh, uh, abilities of women to contribute to reconciliation. You can also fight, but but also <laughs> you, you, you also uh, can help to reconcile. So <laughs> we hope that reconciliation can can gain a lot of uh, of uh, possibilities with the contribution of women in our uh, mission. Got it. Well, if you need some uh, women collaborators to talk to, we're always available. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to ask you about Pope Francis again. I've heard that you have er, that he has a nickname for you, and I'm wondering how that started. Well, I don't know if he 
<laughs> nickname, ghostly father, right? Yeah. He has a nickname for me. He he doesn't uh, refer to me with a nickname, mm. but maybe was a, a what something that happened in my first encounter with him as a pope. He in Rome. That was in September the 2014. Eh? After so many years, maybe 20 years that we have not seen to, uh, together. Since that last time we met, and at that moment he said, I've known you since you were a fool. <laughs> that's, that's the expression that some Jesuits that was the, around there took, and that's, it's not a nickname, it's only a, a way <laughs> of saying, I know you so Got it. long ago. Um, sticking with uh, Pope Francis, um, there's a narrative around him and his papacy that he's um, a radical reformer, and among his fans, uh, this could. Among his fans, among his fans, he's a radical reformer. Uh, <laughs> a reformer. Pope Francis is intentionally acting the fool. Why? To uh, to make irate those Catholics who are pre-Vatican Council II. Vatican Council II, let me hear. Uh, Vatican Council II, okay? This is the blueprint, the manuscript of Jesuit ecumenicalism, okay? It talks about uh, within this Vatican Council II, it talks about how uh, making Bible translations with separated brethren, and also talks about you know how to bring you know how the church needs to be more open onto other denominations and stuff like that. Okay, Vatican Council II onto those Catholics before that who want to have Catholicism rule the world with an iron fist, okay? Pope Francis is demonstrating Vatican Council II to the T to make modern Catholicism look odious onto those who want to see Catholicism return to her power as in the days of the, um, uh, the, uh, the dark periods of the time, um, dark ages, excuse me, okay? Pope Francis, just like Smoking Joe, he, he's not an idiot. He's not a bumbling idiot. He is a performer. And just like she said, his fans, he's an actor. Subservient on to Arturo Sosa. Francis is playing the role of the buffoon in order to make modern Catholicism look odious, so when that man of sin, the son of perdition, comes onto the scene, he's going to reform Catholicism back onto how she was in her glory days during the Dark Ages. Okay? Okay? And this little twit here, his fans, shows you. He's a, he's a celebrity. He's a celebrity. And you look up on the lives of celebrities. Yeah! Continue. Can sometimes lead to disappointment if they think he's not changing things um, fast enough or, or far, going far enough. And among his critics who are worried that, um, you know, he might be doing radical changes that, that um, go against the, you know, the church tradition. Uh and that's true. He is. What Francis is doing is going against their own doctrines. But he's doing that on purpose for reasons we already just discussed. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, what do you think of that narrative? And is it is it the right one? Does it get something wrong about Pope Francis? Watch and what this he's answer. To do um, to the with the church. Well, Pope Francis is without doubt a man of the Second Vatican Council. Amen. He is a man of the Second Vatican Council. But see, every pope has to swear to uphold the Council of Trent, not the Council of Vatican II. But they are all t 
told and swear an oath to uphold the Council of Trent and the doctrines that came from the Council of Trent. That's what they swear to uphold. But he was right. He is of Vatican Council too, meaning that he is doing he is doing all this ecumenical stuff to try to win everybody through fair words and speeches by promising peace, peace, and there is no peace to bring everybody back under the head of Rome. Yeah, his fans, huh? Yeah, yeah, let's continue. For sure. You are young people and you don't, maybe you don't remember Vatican Council, but uh, if somebody wants to understand Pope Francis and his way of proceeding and his leadership needs to go back to the experience, to the decrees, and to the development of the church provoked by the Second Vatican Council. That's a, a, a reference point that we cannot... Uh, <laughs> See, he, he's lying. <laughs> the, the popes are, they, they take an oath to uphold the Council of Trent. What he is saying is that Francis is here just to, uh, to uphold this, which makes the diehard Catholic irate. Oh. Forget if we want to understand what is going on in the church and in the in the mind and the heart of Pope Francis. It is also important to recall the context where Father Bergoglio, uh, many years before, when he never imagined to be a pope, a pope, has lived and served as a Jesuit and later as a bishop. Bergoglio. Uh, have, has been formed and he his ministry in the Argentinian context and in the wider Latin American context in a very very uh, tough situation. No, I mean, uh, when he was a young uh, priest uh, uh, appointed provincial of the Argentinian Jesuits by Father Arrupe was in a you Baptists out there, doesn't he look like Jack Hiles right there, huh? A dictatorship uh, situation, and he has to fight with a very uh, uh, complex political context and church context. And then, after being a bishop in, in Buenos Aires, he has been also a very important uh, man in all the uh, conference of bishops of Latin America. So, Pope Francis is leading the church in the sense of Vatican II, mm -hmm. decided with the adjustments needed by the new times and the signs of the spirit. That's why he is all the time talking about human migration in all its forms, the environment crisis, the growth of inequality, because the Vatican Council uh, teaches us to read the signs of times and to respond to them. And we have to respond with that. Yeah, because her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Yeah. Dialogue among all, especially different religious, and we have to use the dialogue as the path to fraternity. That's dialogue. We have to use dialogue, dialogue. I know there's a Canadian guy who kept talking about, uh, I, we just want to have dialogue with these people. We want to, you know, open up dialogue. Uh, Beware of people who just want to have open dialogue with you. Beware of people like that. Well, we're not supposed to talk to people? Yes, yes, but see, he's using the specific word dialogue. Dialogue. Well, so what? That means talking to people. But yeah, he's using that term, making it impersonal. Okay? Not having any real um, substance between man and man. See? Dehumanizing it, some people would call. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, don't get me started on the word human. Okay, but let's continue. What Pope Francis is trying to do, and he is inspired in recently in the Vatican Council. If we go back, 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 we arrive to the gospel and to Jesus Christ. Um, the last Pope, which is Jesus Christ. Last Pope, which is going to be that man of sin, the son of perdition. <laughs> he, he's boldly telling you people his plans, the plans of the Jesuits. <laughs> I want 
to ask you a little bit more about Pope Francis and and how being a Jesuit has shaped him as Pope. Uh, You know, he's somebody who talks a lot about discernment, which is a really important part of Jesuit spirituality. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, what what we can all learn from Pope Francis about discernment. (laughs) Discernment from the Jesuits who are trained uh, to see that the white I see is black and I will think it black if the superior of the Jesuit order so tells me to. Discernment, yeah, from the Jesuits. Yeah, okay. Second Peter chapter 2. Discernment from the Jesuits. Discernment from the Catholics. Okay. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 17 on to verse 19. These are wells without water. Clouds that are carried with the tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escape from them who live in error. Lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. Well, if Jesus had a church, it would be the biggest one. It would have the most beautiful looking church buildings. Their priests would be dressed in all kinds of pretty little colors it would be such a such a uh, pageantry such a performance in the theater you know yeah yeah okay well they promise them liberty they themselves are the servants of corruption for of whom a man is overcome of the same he is brought in bondage oh oh and, and let's, let's go to June Jude, Jude, verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Skipping to verses 11 on to verse 13. Woe unto them. For they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. You read this, uh, the Sacrita Monita. Um, the audio book for it will be in the description box, so you can listen to it, okay? And also, Brother Alexander Hartley, he does a rendition of, the, he, he also uh did a audio on the Sacrita Monita. Go ahead and check that out. But uh, these are spots. Uh, woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the re- after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, Trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And, of course, Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, verse 10. Titus chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, verses 10 unto verse 11. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And the Jesuits are all about money. The most wealthiest nation on earth is the Vatican. Okay? Rome is the wealthiest nation, wealthiest country, wealthiest uh, political system, wealthiest religion in all the world. And it's like, oh, they have the circumcision. They're not preaching the law of Moses. They are instead changing laws and preaching their own law, okay, to bring these people under their own law that they have made, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, discernment. Discernment from the Jesuits. 
<laughs> who tell you that you shouldn't read the scriptures by yourself because you can get led into error. Well, Catholics are told to read the scriptures, yes, but they got to go to a priest or to their commentary to uh, understand truly because they don't have the spirit. Therefore, they got to go to men to be told what they think the scriptures mean. Discernment from the Jesuits. <laughs> You know, I'm not going to have, I, if I go to a dentist, I don't want a plumber to be my dentist. Okay? Yeah. Get what I'm saying? Let's continue. Pope Francis uh, is not only a Jesuit, he's a Christian. And discernment is, is part of Christianity. Discernment is an essential dimension of Christian life in all times. No, it's not, it's not the, something recently. No, uh, Jesus was a man. And the Catholics call the authorized version heresy. This, uh, this book, the authorized version, is at the top of the list of forbidden books because they teach their... their um, they're people that if they read the authorized version, they'll get into heresy. No, you read the authorized version, um, this leads you on to salvation. Yeah. Discernment from the Catholics, from, from the Jesuits. Uh, no, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. Uh, yeah, I would rather have uh, my nutritionist be Ronald McDonald than to have the, uh, to be told about what the sermon is by the Jesuits. Yeah. And of uh, discernment, if you uh, read attentively, the, attentively the, the Gospels, you will see a man who is all the time trying to understand what is God's will, to follow the God's will. And this Jesus mm -hmm. and all, the, uh, all Christians should uh, do that. And that's why Jesus stayed with us after the resurrection throughout the spirit he gave us the most precious gift his spirit the way of discerning we are about to celebrate pentecost in a few days so we can renew our idea of uh, being guided by the spirit discernment is the skill every christian needs to be guided by the holy spirit and that's why ignatian spirituality is so pointed on that and ignatian Spiritual exercises are a kind of this. Spiritual exercises, which are mind control. Yeah, yeah. It's not the spirit of Christ. It's that, that spirit of antichrist. Okay, the spirit of devils, which will come upon you if you go after the spiritual exercises. He sent him a school mm -hmm. that he, he uh, learned it himself. So following the spiritual exercises, every person can be helped to hear the voice of God calling him to a fully human life and to decide to follow that voice, you not know, to take a, to make an election. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and you can also maybe remember that the, the success of Ignatius with the spiritual exercises were among university students. He was mm -hmm. a university, an old university student, and he get together with some young university students. All the first companions of Ignatius were university students gathered by the experience of the spiritual exercises. So right. uh, this school of discernment has been a very, uh, very fruitful for, for us in all the stage of our life and apostolate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so all Jesuits do the spiritual exercises, but one thing that's always struck me struck me about the society is the the diverse directions that Jesuits go on from there. So you have Jesuits who are teachers, doctors, actors, podcasters, uh, everything you can think of. Um, and you know, that's clearly Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you you, you do. You, you do have Jesuits that are all over, all over. Yes, yes, you do. Yes, you do. 
Uh, let me see, where's the note that I have on that one here? Uh, let's see. Ah, uh, yes. Here is a quote by Brigadier General Thomas M. Harris. Okay, not Kamala Harris or any nonsense like that. Okay? The organization of the Roman Catholic hierarchy is a complete military despotism, of which the Pope is the ostensible head. The black Pope is the head of the Order of the Jesuits and is called a general. He not only has command of his own order, but directs and controls the general policy of the Roman Catholic Church. Yes, he does. He is the power behind the throne and power behind the throne and is the real potential head of the hierarchy. There is no independence of thought or of action in its subordinate parts. Implicit and unquestioning obedience to the orders of superiors and authority is the sworn duty of the priesthood of every, every grade. Okay? It would seem that the Jesuits had had it in mind from the beginning of the war, the American Civil War, to find an occasion for the taking off, killing, of Mr. Abraham Lincoln. The favorite policy of the Jesuits is that of assassination. And if they can't kill you literally, they will kill you by um, smear campaigns. Uh, I, I have personally come in contact with many Jesuit coadjutors working with the order. And they bring about, uh, there's this, a couple that we met from New Hampshire that all of a sudden go uh, crazy and started a slander campaign. And it's like, oh, wow, could, it make, could you guys have made it any more obvious who you're really working for, the Jesuit order? Okay, okay, give me a break. But this, this twit little girl said, you know, how there are Jesuit doctors, there are Jesuit teachers. Yes, and reading from this book, by James Aitken Weil. I'm going to be reading this uh, quote to you from this book. Okay? About that. About, yeah, well, you know, Jesuits are all over. You know, you think of a Jesuit with the doll collar. Uh, no, that's that's the exception. The rule is the Jesuit, like uh, the Smith guy on the Titanic, um, are dispersed among the populace. You know, the gas station attendant at the gas station... Uh, who you paid for your gas might as might be a Jesuit and you don't know it. But a little more what this darling little girl said. Reading from James Aitken Wiles' book here, um, The Jesuits, Their Moral Maxims and Plots Against Kings, Nations, and Churches, written in 1981. This is over 100 years old. Okay? Going to be reading that. Uh, I hope you can see it. That, uh, the, the, it's too small, but here, I'm going to be reading that, where the yellow is, where my fingers are, right there, and also, the highlighted stuff on this page, right here, where my finger is, onto that end, okay? That's what I'm going to be reading to you. She just said, yeah, they're just with doctors, lawyers, actors, yeah. They must acquire a knowledge of all trades and handicrafts. Handicrafts. They must study sciences and arts. They must speak all languages. Why? Because they are infiltrators. They infiltrate. That's what they do. We do not mean that this vast range of accomplishment and capability must it was exacted on the part of each individual Jesuit, but only on the part of the order. It must be in itself an epitome of society. The order must be able to send forth men for all departments of life. You'll hear people say like, well, the Jesuits only concern themselves with the higher ups. That's not true. All departments of life from uh, for the plow, for the loom, for the factory, for the bourse, for the school, for the bench of justice, for the army, and lastly, and for the church. So, the shoeshine boy, the employee at Walmart, 
the gas station attendant, the guy flipping your burger, your waiter or waitress, your doctor, your politicians. And lastly mentioned, of course, the church. You, you know, stay out of church buildings. They're controlled by the Jesuits. I don't care about your tradition of being a, an old-time, independent, fundamental Baptist. I don't care. Uh, and stay out of the church buildings. Stay out of the church buildings, man. They're no good. The Jesuits run them. And here in America, they're 501c3. Well, mine isn't. Well, that's good for you. It's still controlled by the Jesuit order. But let's continue this. Its members must wear an infinity of shapes. Play an infinity of parts and disperse themselves so widely among professional pursuits as to make it impossible to believe, to be believed, that they were all moving on one point and all obeying one head like the Arturo Sosa. Some were to counsel kings, others were to guide the consciences of ministers of state. Others to lead armies, others to declaim in parliaments, and others to harange at country fairs. Arminianism, Anabaptism, they were to be Mohammedan dervishes, okay, Mohammedans, um, Islamic, Indian fakers, F A K I R S. Ah, uh, Hindus? Hmm. And Chinese pundits? Oh, like Taoists? Hmm. By these counterfeits, they would open their way into all circles and to all countries and be able to mold and guide opinion. And yet the quarter from which the inspiration came should not be known. Their mission on which all their efforts were made to concentrate was to quench the liberties of the new age, corrupt the churches of the reformed faith, which they have long ago did, undermine the thrones of disobedient kings, convulse non-Catholic nations and sort, to break down the world and having broken it down, to build it up again and to assume the government of it. You know the pandemic that the Jesuits instituted? Hmm? And you got everybody going to the uh, Catholic disease creators to heal yourself, not to God? Hmm. Yeah. Bravo, little girl. Yeah, that's exactly what they... Look at, look at that face. Look at that face. Mindless zombie right there. Look at that. Yes, the Jesuits are infiltrators, people. Let's continue. We're almost done. Part of the Jesuit charism and the strength of the order. Charism. Oh, um, but as the bad? person who's on top of that, at the neck, how do you how do you manage such a diverse workforce? Well, the fiddle fold, I. Every day I discover something new that Jesuits are doing, you know, because each Jesuit is a, is, a, is a font of creativity. And that is very important to understand that the Society of Jesus is not a, an organization for do something. It's not, mm. we, are, we are not in the society, it's not a job. Mm. We are not, uh, we are not a bit higher for doing a teacher or for doing a, 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 a pastor, a parish pastor, no, we, we, the Society of Jesus is shaped of people who wants to respond to the uh, call of the Spirit, and as we also learn from the, from the Bible, the Spirits, we don't know where, where, where He's going to, to guide us. So, what we need is to be very in touch, very in touch with the spirit and we do not invent the mission for ourselves or try to do new things because of the novelty they can have. We respond to God's will, whatever it might be. And that's my, my uh, 
big responsibility. Yeah, yeah. See, he's talking about the obedience of the Jesuit, who will go down on a sinking ship like the Titanic, or will crash an airplane into a building and bring it down, or strap themselves with explosives and blow themselves up and so they can kill how many other people as well. Ad majorium the glorium for the greater glory of God. Mindless robots who are brilliant. Yes, they have their own mind in a way, but they don't think for themselves. They don't think for themselves. They're programmed. Is to to follow that, not to that to uh, uh, assure that the, the Jesuits, the body of the society, is really following God's will and know what we are uh, discovering or trying to do. The governance of the body thus is done through a flexible structure that trusts a lot in every person who shares the mission and his roots in Christ. And we, we try to together find uh, the way that God is showing us. That's why now, uh, maybe you have here in the last uh, years, a lot of times, that we are deepening in discernment in common, not only discernment uh, as a personal uh, process, but the discernment of the body. So we, we, need, we need to hear as a body the spirit. That's, that's why the next becomes more important also. Yeah. Um I so you you have this amazing diverse, you know, group of people who are doing so many cool and different things. You have you're looking ahead to your your preferences for the future, but at the same time, you know, at least in the US and Europe, vocations have been going down. And so I'm wondering what your vision of the society is in the next 10 to 20 years. How are you guys accounting for that? Quote, and I've quoted this many times, from Napoleon Bonaparte. The Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. The chief is a general of an army, not the mere father abbot of a monastery. And the aim of this organization is power. Power in its most despotic exercise. Absolute power. Universal power. Power to control the world by the volition of a single man. And today that single man, you're looking at him. But in the future that single man is going to be that man of sin, the son of perdition. Who will be filled up, who will be um, controlled by Satan himself. Hence, to rule the world by the volition of a, sa a single man, meaning Satan. That's, that's their goal. The end justifies the means. That's why they're doing all this stuff, making all the people of this planet ready to be controlled by that man of sin, the son of perdition, after we, the church of the living God, are redeemed, resurrected. That's their goal, little girl. Okay? Jesuitism is the most absolute of despotisms and at the same time the greatest and most enormous of abuses. The general of the Jesuits insists on being master, sovereign, over the sovereign. Wherever the Jesuits are admitted they will be masters, cost what it may. Their society is by nature dictatorial, and therefore it is the irreconcilable enemy of all constituted authority. Every act, every crime, however atrocious, is a, meritor is a meritorious work if committed for the interests of the Society of Jesus or by the order of the general. What does that mean? For the greater glory of God. It's for the glory of greater glory of God if you go down on a sinking ship. It is the greater glory of God if you tap uh, tape explosives to yourself 
and go blow yourself up with a bunch of other people. It is the, for the greater glory of God that you slam an airplane into a building and bring it down. For the greater glory of God that you release a biological weapon that kills many people. It's for the greater glory of God that they induce panic, fear, paranoia to bring the people under the control to look onto them for the answer. <coughs> because, look at the pandemic, what happened? Oh, yeah, some people were starting to consider God, but then what happened? What happened? Here comes the Jesuit. Enter the Jesuit. Enter the Jesuit. Yeah, little girl, their aim is to rule the world. And you two nitwits don't want to know that. Sad. Well, the, the first thing I have to say, I, I am not who is going to put limits to the Holy Spirit. Of course not. <laughs> what In what to do. I will try not to put, it's not, my, I have to do the, the all the contrary. So, mm -hmm. uh, about how it's going to be the society, I really you don't know. Back. But anyway, at least it will be formed by people transformed by the encounter with Christ, committed to share the experience with their contemporaries. So that's, uh, that's also when, when uh, we pronounce our vows, we say that, that this is something that we have not started and it's Jesus who started and he will uh, uh, continue to call people to do this kind of lies. I think the society of Jesus in 10 or, or 20 years will be smaller than now in numbers of Jesuits but huge larger in collaboration with others. Well, we are learning a lot in, in collaboration with others and this is a way of being integrated in a in a bigger integrated. way of uh, carrying the mission of Jesus Christ. Yeah. The society of Jesus will be integrated by a greater variety of cultures living in and witnessing interculturality. This is a an amazing uh, characteristic of the society of Jesus. We are so diverse and, and, and this di diversity is Yes, so diverse. Yes. They can be doctors, lawyers, bakers, cooks, floor cleaners, policemen. Yes, yes. They're integrated. Integrated. Yeah. Integrated. It's growing. No, we have people from, I don't know how, how many cultures living uh, the same vocation and the same spirit. Mm -hmm. And our big challenge is to to enrich ourselves from that uh, variety and diversity, uh, living interculturality, no? and mm -hmm. will be a, a society of Jesus adapting their lifestyles and works to the demands of a better balance with the environment. That's I think is a big challenge for our life. How how we uh, embody as a as a big group of persons in many places of the world, coming from different cultures, how we can uh, be witness of a new way of a uh, relationship with the environment. A new world order. He almost slipped. Did you see that? Did you see that? A new world of... He almost slipped. said new world order. <laughs> you almost gave it away there, Pappy. Yeah. Genesis chapter 11. This thing about integrating. This thing about integrating. When people get together, what happens? Hmm? See, God is a God of distinction. God likes distinction. That's not being racist. That's not being bigoted. That's not being sexist, okay? There are our horses but many kinds of horses. There are birds, and many kinds of birds. There are trees, and many kinds of trees. Yes, there are. 
God is a God of diversity and God is a God of distinction. Catholicism wants to bring everybody under the headship of Rome and they're using ecumenicalism, um, bringing all the faiths together, okay? What happens? What has happened historically, scripturally, when all people got together? Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 on to verse 9. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Okay. So, when everybody was of one language and in one speech. No, nope, we're not of all language and of one speech today. But when we come together with the commonality of... Let's all get along. Uh, God loves everybody. Uh, everybody's going to be saved. Come on. We all love God. We all love the Trinity. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, we don't all love the Trinity. The Trinity is Satan. The Trinity, the Trinity is Satanic. Okay? The Trinity is of Satan. Okay? The Trinity is heresy. All right? Just so you know. Okay? But see... When everybody got together, what did they want to do? They wanted to build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, go up above the heights of the clouds, hmm? kind of like what we looked at in Isaiah chapter 14, hmm? and let us make us a name. Yeah. So let's make a big tower that reaches unto heaven that we can make a name for ourselves. That's what happens when there's no distinction. When the lines of distinction are blurred. When everybody comes together in a mel uh, melting pot, which is called the love of God. Yeah. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. And they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. That's what God said, verse 6, in Genesis 11, verses 1 on to verse 9. That's what he said in verse 6. God himself said, okay, when these people, all of them get together and they're doing this, they get together, there's nothing that they won't be able to do. And uh, you, you look at uh, what's being done with the genome thing. Hmm? Um, designer babies and test tube babies. Okay. Look at the pandemic babies that came about. Hmm? Playing God. Yeah. Verse 7. Go to. Let us go down. And there confound their language that they might not that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. They they left off. The city wasn't destroyed. Okay. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did their confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. That's what happens when man, all of man, gets together. When there isn't a right distinction. Okay? Oh, I am all about separation. I am all about distinction. Absolutely. Salvifically, in Christ, we're all one. If you are saved... Born again, converted of the church of God. It doesn't matter your gender. Male or female. Okay? It doesn't matter the color of your flesh. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican. Okay? It doesn't matter. 
If you are truly saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, you are my brother or sister. Guess what? I'm yours. Okay? As pertaining to salvation, culturally, culturally, God is a God of distinction. There are many horses, but there are different kinds of horses. There are many dogs. There are dogs, but there are many kinds of dogs. God is a God of distinction. Catholicism is all about integrating, getting everybody together so that they may be ruled by the volition of a single man, which today is Arturo Sosa, and tomorrow, not literally tomorrow, but tomorrow will be that man of sin, the son of perdition. Let's wrap this up. Yeah, I really appreciate how you're making a point of balancing, you know, memory of the Jesuits roots with the places that it's going to grow, right? Because I don't, I think you understand that there doesn't need to be the separation. You can see it as one continual thing that all of it informs each God other. That is a God of distinction. Um, so I want to ask a you separation. the memory front. Uh, your predecessor, Pedro Arupe, is up for canonization. And I was wondering how that process is going. Uh, not as fast as uh, of my desires, but uh, I do a good pace. Uh, this year, uh, the diocesan phase uh, culminates, and it will be passed to the Holy See. So we are in the in the in the most uh, difficult part that is taking taking the, the testimonies in different parts of the world in Japan in uh, Spain, here in, in, in Italy, and uh, in some other places, uh, people who knew him, or people who has a reference to him, and to put that all together, and also uh, a very uh, uh, qualified revision of the archive. No? Uh, Father Arrupe wrote a lot as a general, and wrote a lot as a provincial, and wrote a lot as, as a uh, director of novices, and so uh, all these all this, uh, his thought is taken in account and to make a, a, a good presentation of the person that he was. And also, we hope to soon be able to accredit some miracle that will lead him to beatification. Uh, that's right. That's another, another, another uh, the, miracle, the miracle is everywhere because we are here. No, you are here. We are here. My, uh, Rupert is the man who has inspired the Society of Jesus as his uh, shape today. Mm -hmm. All right. So we need our, our listeners to pray to, to Father Rupe. To pray to Father Rupe? <laughs> Did you just hear that? Not to God, but to a man? Pray to him? Did you hear that? <laughs> Ashley, Colleen, oh yeah, you're a couple of idiots, you sad little girls. Oh. So we can get some of those miracles. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. Um, we do have one last question for you uh, along those lines. If you could canonize one person, uh, living or dead, Catholic or not, fictional or real, who would it be and why? Well, I got two good candidates. <laughs> we'll allow it. We'll allow it. <laughs> is one a Rupa? Gandhi. Oh. Gandhi. Oh, Gandhi. Okay. Gandhi, the habitual fornicator. Gandhi, okay. Is one. And the other one is Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela. Look up on Nelson Mandela about that thing about what he did to some people about where they would put a tire around uh, people's necks and then fill it with gasoline or something and then pff, set it ablaze. Look up on the sweet, godly uh, Nelson Mandela. Okay. So he would make a saint, Gandhi and Mandela. Interesting. Okay. All right. This, this, why, why, why? Because all of these two persons, uh, first of all, they have a 
very deep interior freedom. And it's amazing when you when you read the life of uh, Nelson Mandela or Mahatma Gandhi uh, living in so hard conditions, no? even in jail as Mandela for so many years, the interior freedom of these two men. And from that interior... And the Jesuits are against freedom, by the way, true liberty. Interior <laughs> freedom, they were very committed with reconciliation and justice. Reconciliation and justice, both together. With themselves, beyond themselves, even beyond their families or friends. They were really working for all human beings. They were uh, creating humanity. And I think they are really saints, in the sense of persons who are the image of God. All right. St. Gandhi and St. Mandela, pray for us. Amen. Uh, <laughs> Did you hear that? St. Gandhi and St. Mandela, pray for us. Oh. <laughs> uh, Father Sosa, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Okay, uh, that, that, that's enough. That, that's enough. That's enough. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, beg your pardon. Yeah, and that's something. And that's something. Distinction, separation. When you combine man together, integrate man together, as the Jesuits are doing, you're asking for trouble. And we are told in the scriptures, Isaiah chapter 52, verses 7 and verse 11. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing. For they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people, he hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all, nation, all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And see, when the Lord saves you, you are part of his body, where there is no Jew nor Gentile, nor male or female, bond or free, barbarian or Scythian, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. But culturally, there's a different story there, okay? Culturally is a different thing. Salvifically, we are all one if you are truly saved. You are my brother or sister, and I'm yours. But culturally, diversity, separation, God is a God of distinction. God is a God of separation, okay? First warning, okay? First warning, under the law. Depart ye, depart ye. Go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. So under the law, the warning to come out from who? From her, Mystery Babylon. Okay? From who? Her? Roman Catholicism. Granted, Roman Catholicism wasn't around during this time, but the Babylonian religion was. Queen of Heaven, as talked about in the book of Jeremiah, okay? The Babylonian religion, which was around since the days of Nimrod, okay? Yeah. The Babylonian, Egyptian, Catholic religion, the one, one religion, okay? In this dispensation, time of the Gentiles, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 on to verse 18. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement 
hath the temple of God with idols. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. What's it like to be the head of the Jesuits? Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. Now, Revelation chapter 17 gives us the identity of the whore, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And that identity is Roman Catholicism. Her colors are purple and scarlet. You might be saying, well, it's white and gold. No. You look at the processions of the cardinals and bishops, always red, always scarlet, crimson and scarlet, okay? Always, always. And they're all decked with gold and precious stones and pearls and stuff like that, okay? All right? You get it? It's Roman Catholicism, it's Mystery Babylon, okay? Roman Catholicism. That's Satan's church. What's it like to be the ruler of such? Well, let's read. Revelation chapter 18 talks about the destruction of Roman Catholicism. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lighted with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul, uh, foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Is, now you might be saying, well, that's talking about Babylon. Spiritually, Babylon. Yes. It's the Babylonian religion. Catholicism is the matter, is the modern Babylonian religion, people. Okay? For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And again, all the political leaders are going to wear the Pope, to the puppet boy, Mr. Francis. Okay? They all go to the Vatican to meet an audience with the Pope. They're not going to the head rabbi in Jerusalem. Okay? Let's continue. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Come out from among them and be separate. Don't be of the world. Don't yoke yourself up with with Catholicism. That that's why uh, it's so it behooves me why people want to tooth and nail defend the God of Catholicism when it comes to regards to Christ Mass. It behooves. It makes no sense to me. Yeah, we have liberty. But you want to use your liberty to defend the God of Catholicism and be Catholic for a day? Makes no sense to me. But more on that later. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. What's it like to be on the, at the top of the mountain? Hmm? Let's read. How much she, Roman Catholicism, hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. Oh, the finest of the world is at the hands of the Jesuits. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow. I shall see no sorrow. Look at place here. Go to Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. Okay. I said queen. I said queen. You know, that's why uh, these people who are 
millionaire Christians or wealthy with lands and all this stuff. They have it hard. They have it worse than us people. They have it worse than those of us who can barely even pay their, pay their bills. Why? Because they have access to this world's goods and it usually corrupts. I've seen it. I've seen it. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. Verses 18 and 19. Uh, verses 17 on to verse 19 in Jeremiah chapter 7. Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire. And the women knead their dough to make cakes to the Queen of Heaven, the Roman Catholic Mary. And to pour out drink offerings on to other gods, and that they may that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger? Saith the Lord, do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? Queen of heaven. I said a queen. Oh, and also, Jeremiah chapter 44. Jeremiah chapter 44. Talking about the queen of heaven. She sits a queen. Yeah. Jeremiah chapter 44. Verses uh, 16 on to verse 19. As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth, to burn incense unto the Queen of Heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, as we have done. And our fathers, our kings and our princes, in the cities of Judah, and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victuals, and were well, and saw no evil. But since we, since we left off to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven, the Roman Catholic Mary, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things, and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. And when we burned incense to the Queen of Heaven, and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her, and pour out drink offerings unto her without her men? Everyone was involved but brought about by the women. And that's something. Hmm. Yeah. And also here, while we're in Jeremiah chapter 44, verses 24 on to verse 27. Moreover, Jeremiah said unto all the people, and to all the women, and remember, the Jesuits are looking to use women a lot more. And you look here online, on YouTube, at these women preachers. Yeah. Yeah, never read Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 before, out of the authorized version. <laughs> That's why you, you need a Bible that suits your purposes, to your preference. <laughs> yeah. Moreover, Jeremiah said unto all the women, and to all, unto all the people, and to all the women, Hear the word of the Lord, all Judah, that are in the land of Egypt. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hand, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. Ye will surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. Yeah. In other words, let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, shall not both fall into the ditch? Hmm? Yeah, uh, that's also reiterated here in Revelation chapter 22, verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Yeah. Verse 26 in Jeremiah 44. Therefore hear ye the word of the Lord, all Judah, that dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, saith the Lord, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saith the Lord, saying, The Lord God liveth. Behold. 
I watch over them for evil and not for good. And all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by the famine until there be an end of them. Back to Revelation chapter 18, picking up at verse 8. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Who is that? Mystery Babylon, the whore, the mother of abominations of the earth. Roman Catholicism. Catholic. Your, your utter end is destruction from the Lord. Your system is the system of Satan. You need to get out of it. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn for her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise, and now this is talking about the wealth of the Vatican, how wealthy they were, okay, how wealthy they are. And because they are so wealthy, they are not plagued as other men. Because they're not, because they can buy countries. They can buy souls of men, okay? The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and, sil and silk and scarlet and all fine wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble all the delicacies of the Roman Catholic Church. And cinnamon, and odors, and ointments, and frankincense, and wine, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves. One of two times, I believe, only two times, that slaves appear in the authorized version of the scripture. And souls of men. Yes, Roman Catholicism is so wealthy, they can buy the souls of men. Not literally, but they can buy slaves. Absolutely. They can buy a country. They've bought America. Okay? And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee. Amen. Can't wait for the destruction of Rome. And all the things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. That's why God says, hey, get out from her. Okay? And saying, alas, alas, that great city, talking about the Vatican, Rome, not Jerusalem, okay? That was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, Roman Catholicism, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Look at the, you know, you, you saw in that video how the popes are wearing all this gold and silver and the precious stones and everything. Yeah, and all the goodly looking adornments in their little castles, church buildings. Yeah, yeah. For in one hour so great riches has come to naught. Nothing. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors, and as many as trade by sea, stood afar off, and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? Weeping, because uh, everything is gone. Everything that they loved, everything that they hoped for, everything that defined them as people, their worldly things, <sighs> went up like a puff, just like that. Just like that. And they cast dusts on their head, dust on their heads, and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour she is made desolate. Today a friend of the Vatican, oh, become quite wealthy. 
Look at America. Look at the look at the elites here in America who have sold out to the Vatican. Look at unfortunately some of the Jews in Jerusalem who have sold out to the Vatican. And the man has a price, huh? Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeteers shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of the millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries, sorceries, were all nations deceived. And if I'm not mistaken, Greek there is pharmakeia where we derive the term pharmacy and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth and that lays specifically at the foot of the Vatican There are going to be a lot of links in the description box for you to go over. If you have any questions, look in the description box. A lot of links. Our, our enemy is Roman Catholicism, which is Satan's church. And you see a lot of people serving the Vatican. And a lot of people teaching doctrines that come from the Vatican. Like denying that there's a redemption of the purchased possession. Saying that you got to be under the law of Moses. Okay? Saying that there's no such thing as once saved, always saved. Saying that you got to be baptized in water. Saying that uh, rightly dividing the word of truth, being dispensational, is heresy. Saying God loves you. Saying that repentance is a work. Prayer is a work. Just believe. Those are satanic doctrines, doctrines from the Vatican, doctrines of the devil. And while that man who would uh, run you over with a car in a drunken stupor and beat you half to death with a baseball bat in a drunken stupor may be your enemy, that spirit that is within these people is that spirit of Antichrist, which comes from Rome. Which comes from Satan. Don't forget who our true enemy is, brethren, people. If you've never heard about any of this stuff, like I said, look in the description box. A lot of stuff for there, there for you to look at. But we got to remember who the fight is truly against, brethren, people. It's against Rome. It's against Rome. And they're going to win some battles. But as we just read, they ain't winning the war. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, thank you for watching this if you do. I hope this has been informative for you. I, I'm sorry that we had to go through that whole thing uh, of that video. Sorry for that. But we had to. to we had to. Um, like I said, there's going to be a lot of stuff for you to look at in the description box. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching this if you do. Any questions, there are emails that you can get a hold of me. Um, someone may answer a question in a comment. I don't know. But um, thank you for watching this if you do. I hope this helps you. So, Going to go. Get this uploaded. Got things to do. We love you. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
I'll see you in the next video, whenever that may be.